Hello everyone and welcome back to another Space News Rundown with me. We have a lot of Starship updates to talk about today, as well as launches from China, Great Britain, Alaska, Florida, some ending in success but some unfortunately ending in failure. Meanwhile, Russia begins preparations for a daring rescue mission after the crew of Soyuz MS-22 became stranded on the International Space Station. We also have some new updates for the SLS rockets for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 and United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur. All of this and more in store, let's kick off with Starship updates. Starting off with updates at the build site, it would appear that Ship 29 has had its nose cone cut off. This means that it's going to be placed in the nose cone cage, this white structure here, that simulates Max-Q forces onto the forward portion of Starship. Perhaps SpaceX are experimenting with new internal structure work for the ships or new materials that will need to be validated. Booster 9 has had a nice little stint down at the launch pad, but it's now been removed and carted off back to the build area. It's undergone some cryoproof testing at the launch area, and now that it's presumably passed all those tests, the next step will be to install Raptor 2 engines. And remember, Booster 9 will be the first Super Heavy to receive the upgraded Raptor 2s, which will use electric thrust vector control rather than hydraulic. Booster 7 was rolled out of the Mega Bay last week for hopefully the final time. It was transported down to the launch site and was then carefully lifted up and onto the orbital launch mount. The chopsticks then opened up and moved their way back down again in order to pick up Ship 24. Before this though, the booster quick disconnect arm was attached to booster 7 in order to pressurise it and allow it to support the weight of Ship 24. Once this was done, Ship 24 was then moved into the open chopsticks before being lifted up into the air. It's unfortunately going to need to be destacked again at some point before launch though, as its heat shield isn't quite complete and it's still got the lifting hooks on its nose which will need to be removed before flight. We got an awesome official SpaceX drone shot video to go with this lift, which is always a nice treat. I do wish we'd get more official drone videos of Starbase. <laughs> this stacking is likely the last stack that will be done for test purposes, and the next time we see these two vehicles integrated, it'll be for the orbital launch attempt. For this round of testing, we're expecting to see full stack cryoproofing and a wet dress rehearsal. On Friday, we saw propellant loaded into both the liquid methane and liquid oxygen tanks for Booster 7, and we also saw the Raptor chill vent on Ship 24 activate, confirming liquid oxygen loading for the ship as well. However, that didn't last for very long, and we didn't really get much evidence of any meaningful amount of fluid being loaded into the vehicle. I think we all love this official SpaceX Starship animation of a future crewed Starship launch. This is a representation of Starbase Boca Chica, but of course, this animation features two launch towers, whereas the real current Starbase only has one. Elon has confirmed several times that SpaceX want to have more than one launch tower in Texas, and it looks like the second launch tower's construction is starting to move forwards. CSI Starbase caught this job listing on SpaceX's website for a supervisor for a tower build, a potential first sign of a second launch and integration tower at Boca Chica. There is also a chance that this advert is still in reference to the tower that already exists. Things like cladding work and other stage zero build activity could all kind of be grouped under the name tower build, but here's hoping this is a sign of a second stage zero in the works. It looks like Ship 22 is being scrapped. Workers were seen removing heat shield tiles and the underlying insulation on Tuesday, which has exposed the weld lines in order to facilitate cutting. Lab Padre's Raptor Roost Cam also caught the removal of the ship's aft flaps as well. There is a chance that the ship is being scrapped in order to make room for something else. Some have speculated possibly for Ship 25. There's a chance that it's been scrapped now and it's no longer planned to fly with Booster 9 and it'll take up permanent residence in the Rocket Garden. However, it was rolled out of the high bay last week and on Saturday it was rolled down to the launch area so it still looks like it's undergoing an amount of testing for now. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below and hey, while you're down there, don't forget to hit the like button and make sure you're subscribed as well so that you get notified of these videos and always stay in the loop about Starship and Space News. Our eye in the sky, Greg Scott, was in the air down at Florida last week to take some photos of SpaceX's facility at Cape Canaveral. At Starbase Kennedy, we can see the factory building nearly complete, with the final framework of the structure almost finished. We can see a new tower segment here as well. We're now up to seven pieces for the second Starbase Kennedy launch tower. We're still not 100% sure where it will go though. High Bay construction still hasn't started yet, 
Presumably SpaceX is still waiting for some permits for this building, or they're trying to clear through some sort of bureaucratic tape before they can make a start. But there's a lot of components on site now, ready for when construction begins. Greg also captured this shot of Launchpad 39A. You can see the chopstick carriage, which moves the arms up and down the tower, is mounted in this red scaffolding here, waiting to be mounted to the tower. Last week, Spaceflight Now captured this footage of the chopsticks being transported from the build site to the launch pad as well, so hopefully it won't be too long now until the launch and integration tower finally gets its mechazilla. Spaceflight Now also captured the installation of the cap of the outer shell of the huge GSE tank at the pad. We're still not 100% sure what this will be used for, it's either a water tank or a liquid oxygen tank. In this shot from Spaceflight Now, you can see a Falcon Heavy on the Falcon pad. This is the USSF-67 mission and is planned to launch only hours after this video goes live to Patreon and channel members, which means I can't really talk about this launch this week unfortunately, but I'll be sure to cover it next week. Falcon Heavy is definitely the coolest currently operational rocket in service in my opinion. Those dual booster landings really are a great watch. One SpaceX launch I can talk about this week was Tuesday's Falcon 9 launch, which saw the rocket carry 40 OneWeb communication satellites to low Earth orbit. Although there were 40 satellites on board, the overall mass wasn't too high, which meant that the Falcon 9 first stage had enough fuel left over after second stage separation for a full boost back burn back to the landing zone, instead of needing to land on a drone ship. While this shot is at night, so the visibility isn't great, it's still really cool to see these third-person viewpoints of these giant rockets coming in to land. The day before this launch, on Monday, we saw the very first orbital launch attempt from the United Kingdom. This was Virgin Orbit's Air Launched Launcher 1 vehicle, which was carried into the air from Spaceport Cornwall by the Cosmic Girl aircraft, which then deployed the rocket over the sea just off the coast of Ireland. The livestream wasn't particularly great, there were no camera views, so all the footage you're now watching wasn't from this flight. On board the rocket were various satellites from British customers, as well as the Aman, Oman's first ever satellite, and the Polish Stork 6 observation satellite. Unfortunately, the rocket didn't make it to orbit. An anomaly in the second stage resulted in premature engine shutdown, meaning that the payloads did get to space, but then they re-entered and were destroyed in the atmosphere. A shame, but this is the first time that Virgin Orbit has lost a customer satellite, and they've now commenced an internal investigation to figure out what went wrong here. This rocket can technically say it was the first orbital launch attempt from England, although it's not like really technically launched from England, it's just the plane that takes off from Cornwall and then it deploys the rocket over the ocean. It's not like a proper spaceport, right? Well, if Spaceport Cornwall doesn't meet your definition of spaceport in the UK, then Saxaford Spaceport should. This is an orbital rocket launch site that's being built on the Lamberness Peninsula on Unst, the most northerly of the Shetland Islands off the Scottish coast. The team recently shared this construction time-lapse of a launch pad and launch stool. What will be flying from here? Well, the spaceport has announced a partnership with Rocket Factory Augsburg, a German space startup founded in 2018 with the mission to build rockets just like cars. It's currently working on the RFA-1, a three-stage small sat launch vehicle which they eventually hope to launch in late 2023. If you don't want to wait that long though, then you can actually fly this rocket for yourself in Kerbal Space Program with the RFA mod. This isn't a fan recreation either. This mod pack was made by the actual RFA team, which is pretty cool. Are there any other KSP mods that were created by the people who made the real-life counterpart? <laughs> anyway, back on the subject of Saxaford Spaceport briefly. The other proposed launch vehicle that may use this facility is ABL Space's RS-1 rocket, and this vehicle had its maiden flight last week. This vehicle has had a somewhat rocky ride so far. In January 2022, an anomaly during testing resulted in the destruction of the rocket's second stage due to a hard start of one of the engine's turbo pumps, resulting in a substantial fire that resulted in complete failure. The first orbital launch was originally supposed to happen in December 2022, but the launch attempt was scrubbed three times, causing it to be pushed forward to last week and the maiden flight unfortunately failed. Not that you can see it, <laughs> all we have is this video of the launch and then that's it. ABL Space confirmed on Twitter that the rocket experienced an anomaly and shut down prematurely. All nine engines shut down simultaneously and the rocket fell back down to Earth and was destroyed, causing damage to the launch facility in the process. Do you guys remember the coolant leak on the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft's thermal control system on the 14th of December? Well, Roscosmos, in agreement with NASA and other space station partners, have announced that the spacecraft will not carry its crew back to Earth. 
unless there is an extreme emergency. Instead, the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft will be launched uncrewed, with the MS-23 crew moved to MS-24. And the crew who should have come back on MS-22 will now come back on MS-23, with MS-22 just deorbiting on its own. In other space station news, the SpaceX CRS-26 Dragon spacecraft autonomously undocked on the 9th of January, carrying research samples from completed station experiments on board. It has since splashed down and been recovered. We had a lot of launch activity from China last week. I'll quickly run through all of these now. On Sunday the 8th, a Long March 7A carried a technology demonstration satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. On Monday, a Ceres-1 carried five satellites to orbit, which will be used for commercial remote sensing, meteorological observations, and internet services. On Thursday, a Long March 2C carried a single communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. On Friday, a Long March 2D carried two technology demonstration satellites and one reconnaissance satellite to low Earth orbit. And on Sunday the 15th, another Long March 2D carried 14 satellites to orbit, all but two of which are for Earth observation for various customers, and the remaining two are technology demonstration satellites. Tori Bruno shared a clip of United Launch Alliance's first Vulcan rocket core booster being loaded onto a transport ship for its trip to Cape Canaveral. Vulcan is one of the big launches to look forward to this year. It's the successor to the legendary Atlas V and Delta IV heavy rockets, both of which have sold their final contracts now. In Artemis III news, NASA has completed the welding of the Artemis III core stage tank dome at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. The next step for this component will see it loaded into the facility's robotic welder that'll join it with the forward barrel of the rocket's liquid oxygen tank. Later on, another barrel and dome will be added to complete the tank, which will be able to hold around 900,000 litres of supercooled liquid oxygen to feed those four thirsty RS-25 engines, producing around 900 tonnes of thrust. It isn't just Artemis 2 and 3 being worked on though. Here's some footage of NASA technicians moving the engine section of the SLS rocket for Artemis 4. This is the first major piece of hardware for the Artemis 4 mission and comprises the lowest component of the core stage, housing the four RS-25 engines and containing all of the systems for mounting, control and fuel delivery from the fuel tanks to the engines. Moving on to Artemis missions that have actually happened, so just Artemis 1, we've had the first images of the crew after they returned to Earth. The Orion capsule, of course, was bravely solo piloted by Snoopy, the zero gravity indicator that was secured inside the Orion for its journey beyond the moon and back to help prepare for human crewed missions. Snoopy's Orion capsule is currently inside the multi-payload processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. During deservicing, all payloads will be removed from the capsule and the heat shield and other elements will be detached for extensive analysis. Lown Aerospace was back in business last week. Things have been a bit quiet on the Kerbal side of my channel lately because I've been doing this master's module as part of my IRL job, but I've since passed my exams and stuff and now I've nearly finished my portfolio write-up, so I should be able to start posting more Kerbal missions again. Last week we visited the brand new Monarch Anomaly and set up a science colony there. Click that card on screen if that sounds interesting to you. And of course, if you want to see your name on the left, then you can join my Patreon or join my channel to get early access to videos and exclusive emojis for stream chats in the comments section. And obviously, get your name there as well. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> but anyway, thank you all so much for watching today, and I'll see you all next time.